What's going on, Packer fans? Welcome back to the Packer Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Thanks so much for joining me today. I think this is going to be a quick, easy, fun episode. I figured I'd take a look at some realistic free agent options. You might be thinking, Andy, free agency's over, bud. Like, what, what are we doing here? But let's not quickly forget that last year, June 9th, which not that far off from what, June 21st today, uh, the Packers signed Devondre Campbell. And last year, July 28th, Dennis Kelly signed with the Packers. So uh, we're not far off again uh, from about a year, just a little over a year ago, Devondre Campbell signing. And it wasn't even a year ago that Dennis Kelly signed. So uh, this is still a time where free agency moves can be made. And with the Kent, Kurt Benkert release, the Packers have an open roster spot available if they want to use one. And I'm sure they will prior to training camp. So in all likelihood, this is going to be another like, you know, seventh string tight end from Indiana State that made the transition from quarterback to tight end. Uh, but let's just play this out and go over five, re- what I think are at least semi-realistic options for the Packers to sign prior to the start of training camp, potentially addressing some needs. The first thing I will say here is I searched long and far for potential safety options because this is still less. I'm excited about Sean Davis. I, I'm in, I should say more intrigued by Sean Davis. I was excited by some of his explosiveness in OTAs and, and mini camps. I want to see what he can do when the pads come on in training camp. He seems to be safety number three, but there's there's unknowns there, right? I think that's fair to say. You know, you don't know exactly what you have in a Vernon Scott or a Sean Davis and Ennis Gaines, those t- type of players. So ideally, you would have somebody there that if a Darnell Savage or if an Adrian Amos goes down, you have somebody that you can have faith and confidence in. I just don't see that. Jaquiski uh, Tart uh, was just signed. Um, he would have been a player that I would have mentioned here again. I believe I've mentioned him in the past, uh, but he just signed a free agent deal, I believe, with the Eagles of memory serve. So there's, I looked, at, there's not really anything. Like Landon Collins is a name, um, but if you take away his first round pick status, his big free agent money in the past, and the fact that he's probably what still an 80 something on Madden uh, and just watched his play on the field, you wouldn't actually be intrigued with him signing with the Packers more specifically due to the fact that he just doesn't cover well anymore at all. He, he just can't cover. So I think there's some things that he could do well. You could play him in the box still. So that could potentially be an option, but um, that's not super intriguing. And Tayshawn Gibson um, had a really nice year a couple years ago with the Bears, but fell off last year with the Bears. So um, I don't know. I, there's there's just not a safety that I see right now that makes a ton of sense. So Green Bay may have to go into the season with what they have, but let's go into the five free agents that I do think are at least semi-realistic possibilities here. The first still remains Kevin King. And I know that's tough. That is tough for me even still to say out loud because I have not exactly been a huge Kevin King proponent over the years. But at this point, you're looking at vet minimum money, right? Like you're not giving him any more than that. He's probably not getting any more than that anywhere else from any other team. And you can strongly make an argument that him at least knowing the system from last year and knowing the team and knowing the culture and knowing everything like that still has some value. I would probably argue against that still had it not been for two things last year. A, they started using him in a variety of different ways. They used him in the slot a little bit more. They almost used him as a box safety at times. They used him in a variety of roles, specifically sometimes against some of the bigger tight ends, right? So you've got this variety of players. Razul Douglas might be able to do that, but, you know, Stokes is staying on the outside. You don't want Jair Alexander against bigger tight ends. You know, they they just don't have that flavor of player that has the the bigger uh, build. Now, that hasn't always helped Kevin King. I'll readily admit that. But the fact that he showed more versatility and they used him in specific ways that I thought he could be successful in and he found some success in makes me slightly more intrigued. And the fact that towards the end of last year, they started using him on special teams more with some level of success as well. So the fact that he can play a little bit of special teams, the fact that he can have a specific role, the fact that he has started, uh, you know, probably too many games in the league. But the, the point remains that if you, if that's your choice over a KB and Ento or somebody like that. And again, I love KB Nento. I think there's some exciting young players on this team. I still think there's a void for that, you know, fourth, fifth corner spot. You know, you'd like to see Kayshawn Nixon uh, really get some, you know, competition for that spot. 
And once again, if if Razul Douglas or Eric Stokes, Jair Alexander were to go down, you'd ideally want more depth there, right? So there's not, it's not like you're going to find a top tier corner still on the market. I think Kevin King has uh, maybe what Green Bay could be looking for if in fact he's re- you know, ready and willing to take a vet minimum deal. They did give his number 20 jersey away to Danny Davis, so that may not be the best sign in the world, but if they wanted him back, I'm pretty sure they could get that number 20 jersey back pretty easily. All right, next up on my list, let's stick with the cornerback spot. And this is a little bit of an older player, uh, Chris Harris Jr., well, in his, well into his 30s. The thing that I'll say about Chris Harris Jr. is he is a true primary slot corner. And yes, I do think that Razul Douglas has potential there. We know Jair can play there, but as we've talked about in the past, this is not a player in Jair Alexander that you want playing snap after snap after snap in the slot. Just probably too much wear and tear on his body. Keishon Nixon is going to be a potential slot corner, but this is just a potential upgrade. Harris can play on the outside if you need him to. He is a true, a tried and true slot corner who can play there with a level of consistency that Green Bay just doesn't have clarity on at the moment. This would still be an upgrade over Chandon Sullivan, who was there a season ago. And I'm not necessarily saying that Green Bay needs to play Chris Harris as a full-time player. If you want to go Douglas in the slot with Stokes and Jair on the outside, and then when you go into obvious passing situations, move Jair in the slot and put Douglas and Stokes on the outside, I think that's totally fine. But I still think that Harris is a clear upgrade as a number four. Keishon Nixon still profiles to me as a ideal number five corner with a ton of special teams ability. And then if you keep a six, which you probably do, it can be a more young developmental special team type of type of player maybe like a KB and Ento. So I think that stacks up a little bit more, but that fourth corner spot, if you could just move Nixon down one spot and put somebody like a Chris Harris Jr. who can be that primary slot. And the thing is, is a lot of times, like if you're just a primary slot, your value goes down a little bit because it, uh, you know, you're you're not playing on the outside. Those outside corners have bigger value. But A, Chris Harris can play outside in a pinch. And B, because you have Douglas, Stokes, and Jair, who are all true outside corners, you can invest a little bit more in a slot corner specifically. And in this case, I think this would also be a vet minimum type of deal. So that could be another realistic option for Green Bay. Just buoy the depth of the, the secondary and the cornerback spot a little there. As I've talked about in the past, I think Green Bay has good, you know, overall depth on this team. I think defensive line has depth. I think inside linebacker has depth, but edge corner safety are some of the concerns. If you can, you know, shore up that corner spot a little bit more, I think that could make a lot of sense and help Green Bay going into the season. The next one is probably my favorite and most important uh, on this list, and I think that's Justin Houston. Yes, Justin Houston is 33 years old and he is past the prime of his career. But this is a very Whitney Merciless type signing from a year ago. You don't need him to be a primary edge rusher. You don't need him to play, you know, 40, 50, 60 snaps per game. He can have a very situational role. And yes, following Rashawn Gary and Preston Smith, I do believe that Green Bay still needs that guy who can come in and still get pressures. Houston had six sacks, 12 hits, 22 hurries, playing only 577 snaps a season ago and only 391 pass rush attempts. He's had a pro football focus grade of over 62 his entire career. 60 is average. So he's been over 62 his entire career and had a 77.8 grade a season ago and still profiled well as a pass rusher. This to me would be a key signing for Green Bay. Just gives, it takes a little bit of pressure off of Preston Smith, a little bit of pressure off, to, off of Rashawn Gary. And you're not relying on a Tipa Naliai, a Jonathan Garvin, a Kingsley Kiki, who I have faith with down the road. But again, you'd like him to be your number four or number five at this point. So I think that makes a ton of sense and would really, really solidify the edge group and make it a super strong group going into next season. The next one, your favorite player, my favorite player, Matt Overton. Matt Overton is a long snapper. I am not going to break down a ton of long snapping stuff here, but Overton's had a very nice long career as a long snapper. And yes, he's well into his 30s. It doesn't matter at this point. You don't need a guy that can get down the field and, you know, like sprint down the field for punts and things like that. He will do just fine in that regards. He has his entire career. What you need is somebody who can make sure that Mason Crosby is successful. And to me, I have still not seen enough. You know, we'll see what Coco can do. 
do. I don't know enough uh, about him yet, but I have not seen any sort of consistency from Steven Wordle. I would much rather they go into camp with a Coco and a Overton, uh, almost like a Coco Ovaltine, I guess, but a Coco and an Overton, a veteran in his 30s and an undrafted rookie, and just let them compete. And if you know what, if the veteran beats him out, great. If the rookie beats him out, great. But at least have a true competition, knowing that you have one long snapper in camp that has a ton of consistency and a long career in the NFL. I would go with Matt Overton, but uh, that it just get a little bit better competition in there. You've fixed everything. You've tried to fix everything else around Mason Crosby. I still have a lot of questions about that long snapper position and long snapper is never a problem until it's a problem, right? Last year, it was a problem at times and you don't want to see that happen again this year. I would love to see Matt Overton in training camp. And last but not least, maybe this one is slightly unrealistic depending on how much he's looking for and those sort of things, but that's offensive tackle Eric Fisher. Eric Fisher is the exact type of you know player that Brian Gutekinds loved. He was a 9.82 RAS guy coming out of college, super athletic guy, was the number one overall pick. And these are sort of the players that Green Bay will take chances on in you know with guys in their 30s, guys who are premium athletes, high draft picks, and super athletic, and you know are having trouble finding a job. Maybe like that's Eric Fisher right now. And maybe Fisher's just looking for the right job and the right role and the right money, and he's not just going to come back for any you know small deal. And if that's the case, then he's probably not going to be a fit in Green Bay. But if he's looking for a job that maybe isn't you know going to pay a ton of money and wants to go out and compete for a championship, I think this deal makes so much sense on so many different levels. Listen, I've heard the talking points with David Bakhtiari and maybe Bakhtiari comes in, practices day one at training camp, and there's never an issue for the rest of his career. And he goes on and has a healthy, amazing remainder of his career. But even if you're the most eternal optimist in the world, where David Bakhtiari is with his knee, you have to at least have some concern of like, all right, even if he is a go for training camp, is this going to be something that affects him at some point this season? Is he going to have to get that knee drained again? Is he get, is this going to be something where he's going to have to sit out games to give it some rest? We just don't know. I, like, and obviously I know way less than the Packers do at this point. And maybe they're like 99.9% confident that there's not going to be any issues, but this would just give Green Bay a lot more insurance at that left tackle position. In the meantime, you can immediately slide him over and start him at right tackle. Now, to be fair here, Fisher hasn't played right tackle since 2015, and he hasn't played a full season of right tackle since 2013, but he's done it, and it's something that is probably still uh, within his purview if he wants to do that. So, I think he can immediately come in and compete at right tackle or not even compete. If he signs, even if Bakhtiari is healthy, he's your starter at right tackle. And then Yash Nijman profiles perfectly as that left tackle, right tackle swing guy, which is fantastic. And then when Elton comes back, you can A, keep him inside for the time being, which means probably at right guard, which gives Royce Newman and it gives all of your rookies more time to develop. And then it pushes Yash as your swing tackle, Royce as your swing guard, and then probably Jay Hansen in your backup center role. And that is a phenomenal six, seven, and eighth offensive lineman with, you know, Cole, you know, maybe Cole Van Lannan and your, your three rookies. You've got some options after that for, you know, how you want to divvy up the rest of the offensive line. But in the meantime, you know, it allows you to put probably hopefully Bakhtiari, John Running Jr., Josh Myers, then, you know, you have a real competition at right guard between probably Hanson, Royce Newman, and maybe Sean Ryan gets in the conversation. And then right tackle is Eric Fisher. If Bakhtiari eventually goes out or has complications, you put Fisher at left tackle, you can put Nijman at right tackle or vice versa. You can flip those up as well. And then once Elton Jenkins gets back, you probably keep Fisher at left tackle and keep put Jenkins at right tackle. And again, or you could flip those as well. But this to me massively solidifies your offensive line. It gives you depth, versatility, and insurance. And once you get Elton Jenkins back, then, you know, the other thing is like if Bakhtiari goes down, if Runyon goes down, if Myers goes down, if Newman or Ryan or Hanson or whoever's at right guard goes down, if Fisher goes down, who's ever going down, you've got Elton Jenkins, right? Now, clearly he's going to be one of the starters once he's back. But I'm saying like, if during that time frame one of the other players gets hurt, guess what? The answer is Elton Jenkins in that scenario. So 
I would love, love, love that signing and just think it makes a ton of sense. This offensive line needs to be better than they were a season ago. And you don't know when you're going to get Jenkins back. Bakhtiari, there's still that questioning cloud lingering over everything. This would really help solidify and answer a lot of those questions or maybe more appropriately ease some of those concerns. That is going to do it for me today. Just a quick recap. Kevin King, Chris Harris Jr., Justin Houston, Matt Overton, and Eric Fisher. Yes, these are some older players, but I do think they fit well in this win now mentality for Green Bay and just add a bit more depth to this Packers roster. We will see if Green Bay does in fact sign any veterans before the start of training camp, but if and when they do, we will be right here to cover it. Thanks so much for joining me. Always appreciate it. We'll be right back here tomorrow, but until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.